We're about to uh, conclude our, our discussion on the person of Christ with this presentation. And I wanted to, uh, we'll move on to other things after that, but I wanted to uh, sympathize with you if you are wondering why are we looking at uh, some of these perversions and why are we looking at some of these uh, clear skeptical approaches to understanding who Christ is. And I'm, I'm saying that uh, if you thought this was just going to be about reading Bible passages, um, and God bless you. I'm sorry to let you down. But there's, there's more you need to know about how Christ is understood in today's culture and how some have interpreted, and I would say poorly interpreted, the passages of Scripture that we all love to read. Uh, you need to be aware that they're capable of being misunderstood. And you may very well encounter a, a church worker or a church member who has been led astray by some of these uh, false teachings. Um, one, of the, one of the things that shocked me a while back was when Marcus Borg, the author of Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, came to speak at the First Presbyterian Church in Highland Park and was highly touted. Well, he's a man that tells us that Jesus is no more than just a, a, a mere human and that uh, Jesus uh, was trumped into something that he never meant to be. Great, grateful uh, I am that uh, Borg was refuted soundly by N.T. Wright in rediscovering who Jesus was and is, the challenge of Jesus. And we recognize that certainly there is a challenge. Jesus is this one-of-a-kind character. And <clears throat> trying to understand who he is is obviously extremely crucial. And it certainly meant a lot to Jesus that you would understand who he is. And it would make no surprise to me then that it's a, a, an area where there's a lot of distortion. And, and I would say that a lot of distortion is, is human, uh, human frailty of our minds. And, and part of that distortion is a demonic attack against the truthfulness of who Jesus is. They know who he is. He told them to shut up, by the way. But we're supposed to proclaim it once we've discovered who he is. And so we will continue to do so. The next thing we'll look at is something called docetism. It's the view that Jesus was God, but not human. Docetists essentially taught that Jesus only appeared to be human, but in fact, he was not. Docetism contradicts many scriptures, such as 1 John 4, 1 and 3. Uh, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many False prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. So, um, Ebionism is another uh, perversion of Christology, um, bad teaching here of who Christ is, the view that Jesus was fully human but not divine. The Ebionites denied the deity of Christ. Ebionism viewed Jesus as a normal human who was simply empowered by God. And Ebionism is rejected by a multitude of scriptures, such as uh, before Abraham was, I am, and <clears throat> John 10, 30, which states, I and the Father are one. And Philippians 2, 6, which states, um, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of God a thing to be grasped. And Hebrews 1, 8, which teaches us, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is said of the Son. How about the kenosis theory? This comes from a passage in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That word emptied comes from a Greek word, uh, and kenosis is used here to tell us that Christ actually gave up some of his divine attributes while he was on earth as a man. It's also called the kenotic theory. <clears throat> and it's seeking to account for some of the difficulties. And for one of those difficulties that this theory tries to, tries to answer is, a, well, how could Jesus' humanity be significant if he retained all his attributes as God? Didn't he have an unfair advantage? Also, uh, a difficulty comes up. How could Jesus' attitude to the Old Testament be correct? Now, this one comes up because of, of modern uh, radical liberal scholarship. 
which says, we now know that Moses did not author all of the Torah. And Jesus clearly affirms that Moses is the author of all of the five books of Moses, of the Torah. That Isaiah didn't author all of Isaiah. And clearly Jesus refers to Isaiah as the author of all parts of the prophet, the book, the prophet Isaiah. And that Daniel didn't author all of Daniel. And clearly Jesus referred to Daniel as being authored by the prophet Daniel. Well, obviously, if you don't have those, those, those um, false beliefs, then, then this is not going to help you, the kenosis theory. But what they're doing is trying to redeem Jesus. Well, that was his humanness that thought Moses wrote all five books. That was his humanness that thought that there was only one author for Isaiah. That was his humanness that thought that the, the prophet Daniel actually wrote the book of Daniel. But it doesn't work very well. By the way, this is, not a, a, uh, this is not an ancient theory. It started in 1853, and it's rooted in a rationalistic worldview that rejects biblical inerrancy and biblical believing. <clears throat> Notice that Philippians 2.7 doesn't say, <clears throat> read it again, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Philippians 2.7 doesn't say he emptied himself of some powers. It could have said that if that's what we were supposed to understand. Or that he emptied himself of his, of his divine attributes. It doesn't say that. The context of Philippians 2.7 does say that he took the very nature of servant. Now let's look at the next verse, chapter 2, verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. So could it be that the emptying of himself was in that he took the form of a servant and that he humbled himself by becoming obedient? This does not allow then for him having set aside his divine powers. Now, it is a mystery how the things that Christ does in upholding the universe continued to take place while he was here and living the life of a human, but we don't want to act as if Christ could become other than what he always was. Now, Paul's purpose in this section is to form an attitude in the Philippians. He wanted, in chapter 2, verse 4, not to urge them to give up any of their essential attributes, but to be instead uh, having a humble mind. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's his goal in telling us about what Jesus did. So when you have the form of a servant, you do take on the interests of others, don't you? Without losing any of your powers. And when you, become, you humble yourself through obedience, you don't lose any of your powers, but indeed, you are showing yourself interested in the interests of others. <clears throat> so what was happening to the rest of the world during the period of the Lord's earthly life? Um, certainly, that is, a, uh, that is a, uh, a, an interesting question to have. But the Chalcedonian Creed sought to contradict any false beliefs about Jesus. And he was never anything but fully God. And from his conception... In the incarnation on, he was never anything but fully human and still is. We want to maintain this continuity between the pre-existent son and the incarnate son. We don't want to have, have a problem with Jesus having a case of amnesia. And primarily, this, this particular doctrine, false doctrine, is a sign of the times. Um, we, we need to take into account the type of world into which uh, this doctrine was first suggested. The major force persuading people to accept this theory was not that they had discovered a better understanding of Philippians 2.7 or of any other passage, but rather the increasing discomfort people were feeling with the, the formulations of the doctrine of Christ in historical classic orthodoxy. It just seemed too incredible for modern, rational, and scientific people to believe that Jesus Christ could be truly human and fully absolute God at the same time. So the kenosis theory began to sound more and more like an acceptable way to say that in some sense Jesus was God, but a kind of God who had for a time given up some of his godlike qualities, <clears throat> those that were the most difficult for people to accept in the modern world. This age was learning to think in terms of the categories of psychology. Consciousness was a central category. If at our center is our consciousness, and if Jesus was both omniscient God and limited man, then 
He had two centers, and he was thus fundamentally not one of us. Christology was becoming inconceivable for some. In other words, pressures of modern psychological study were making belief in the combination of full deity and full humanity and the one person of Christ difficult to explain or even intellectually embarrassing. How could someone be so different from us and still be truly a man? <clears throat> Yet we might respond that modern psychology is inherently limited and that its only object of study is simple, mere human beings. No modern psychologist has ever studied anyone who was perfectly free from sin, as Christ was, and who was both fully God and fully man, as Christ was. If we limit our understanding to what modern psychology tells us is possible or conceivable, then we will have neither a sinless Christ nor a divine Christ. In this, as in many other points of doctrine, our understanding of what is possible must be determined not by the modern empirical study of a finite fallen world, but by the teachings of Scripture itself. And for that preceding section, I give uh, great credit and thanks to Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology. How do we respond to the canonic theory? Uh, we're going to recognize that the Christ of faith here is being sacrificed to the Jesus of history. And this, this uh, ends up having a Christ with no divine attributes, no divine prerogatives, no divine consciousness. He set aside what it meant to be God in order to be man. That's what the canonic theory is telling us. But then we are not coming to grips with the passages in Mark 4, 41, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, John 1, 14, and many others. Jesus clearly saw himself while on earth as divine, and he clearly portrayed himself as divine, and he was worshipped on earth as divine. Now there is a true kenosis, but the kenosis is of us emptying out of ourselves that old man and being rid of it and moving on to the new man. Could Jesus have sinned? Well, Scripture teaches us that he never did. 1 Peter 2.22, 1 John 3.5, Hebrews 4, 15, 7, 26. We've looked at some of these passages already. And we know that Jesus Christ was tempted. Luke 4, 2. Temptation in the wilderness. Hebrews 2, 18. We also know that God cannot be tempted with evil. It says in James 1, 13. If Jesus was fully God, as well as fully man, how could he be tempted with evil? Is one of our Christological questions that we have. And the impeccability of Christ is, is, is uh, saying that they could never have sinned. Did Jesus have a fallen human nature? And if yes, then how could he be a lamb without blemish? If no, then how could he be fully human? <clears throat> you should take a look at Edward Irving's um, major uh, uh, questions about this. And there is much about Edward Irving that is to be commended. But on this one topic, we will want to be careful to not, um, uh, to not um, uh, follow Edward Irving. He was well respected in many other ways, but in this one topic, we'll want to be careful not to, um, not to follow uh, his particular teaching. Uh, McLeod says on pages 228 and 229 um, that um, Irving is to be well respected for his devotion and devoutness. Uh, but he asked the question, how can the nature be fallen without implicating the purpose? To be fallen is to have sinned against God, and to be fallen is to be in a state of sinfulness, devoid of righteousness, devoid of righteousness, and wholly defiled. How can any of this apply to Jesus? Well, how are we then to express the sinlessness of Christ? Unfallen Adam, the fallen Adam, was able not to sin. <clears throat> fallen Adam was not able to not sin. And we are not able to not sin prior to our coming to Christ. Romans 3, famous passages, chapter verses 9 through 18. And Isaiah 64, 6, even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And Ephesians 2, 3, we are by nature objects of wrath teaches us that we're not able to not sin prior to our coming to Christ. In one way or another, through our pride, through our motives, through our thoughts, through our words, sin is something that we uh, are eventually incapable of, of resisting totally. <clears throat> 
But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, was not was able not to sin. Now, the view from the balcony, that is, from God's perspective, was that he was not able to sin. And the view from the road is that he did not get any special advantage as a result. Because look what happened to him. Even though he's able not to sin, uh, to not sin, it says here, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. In Mark 14, 33 through 34, he encountered sorrow even though uh, he was able not to sin. In, Ma in Matthew 4, 4, he, uh, he has to resist by citing scripture, the temptations of the devil. In Mark 14, 35, <clears throat> he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, an hour might pass from him. This hour of his, of his uh, sacrifice. He didn't get any big benefit, even though he was able not to sin. So, some modern distortions of the person of Christ uh, are Boltman's Christ event theology. What counts isn't some mythical events in history, however, but rather the preaching of Jesus and of the early church. Well, that's what Boltman's teaching. Doesn't really count what happened, but that they preached the good things about Jesus. And what happens here is Bultmann's posing what is a false dichotomy. Sheer rationalism is faith based only on evidence, and sheer irrationalism is faith with no basis in evidence. And by posing those two uh, dichotomies, is there a third possibility? That indeed we can have faith that is based on evidence that is willing to take God's word as evidence in the absence of empirical evidence. That's a third possibility between sheer rationalism and sheer irrationalism. And Boltman doesn't allow for that. Another distortion of the modern teachings of, 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 the, the, of Christology is John Hick's myth of God incarnate. And he says that Jesus never was God, but they made him the Son of God. Uh, they made the Son of God into God the Son at the Nicene Council. Well, even if we say that the incarnation as a, doctor, as a doctrine has a, a history of development, even if we granted that, the resurrection does not have a history of development. It was clearly affirmed early on by all the first believers. So the idea that John Hick has has been discarded. And then, of course, John Hick also, the pluralist, um, later on became a pluralist, said that th there's a myth of Christian uniqueness. Exclusiveness is reject Exclusivism is rejected. We're not going to accept any religion that says it's the only way. Pluralism is endorsed. Don't you know all religions are, are equally valid truths to the ultimate uh, equally valid truths and paths to the ultimate. And the response to that will be that exclusivism, being exclusive doesn't require a belief that only Christians have truth. I can understand truthfulness in some of the statements of Buddhists who say that craving causes um, a lack of peace. We agree with that. I can see some of the statements of Confucius, the Confucian religion, about the need to show deep respect for your, your aging parents. We agree with that. We're not saying that they have no truth, but we're saying that the truth uh, that is ultimately the redemptive truth is found only in Jesus and found only in the Christian gospel. In actuality, this idea that exclusivism is really bad is to deny the basic nature of all religions. They're all exclusive. They all make mutually exclusive truth claims at one point or another. And pluralism, the belief that all religions are, are equally valid paths to the same uh, ultimate, is itself exclusivist. It will exclude all those who disagree with it. So it's pretty difficult to, uh, to accept those positions that uh, have been espoused. Finally, we want to look at one last thing. It's called liberation theology. This is a teaching uh, rose in some South, uh, South American Catholic priests that the way to really embrace Christ was to embrace him in his tradition of being one who liberated the poor from oppression. And our responses to this involve that Christians aren't moving towards liberation. They are starting from liberation. 
Christ's example is impossible in some ways to follow. Only Christ can do that. And he, not you or me or we, uh, is the great liberator. Matthew 28, 18 tells us that he's the one that will bring it about. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says that he is the great liberator. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls through Jesus, not through Christians imitating Jesus as liberators. And Mark 1, 15 says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the response we should have. That's what is going to bring about the kingdom of God. Liberation theology has been used as a front for all kinds of, of uh, rebel, uh, rebel movements, and not that some of those didn't have good purposes to overthrow oppressive governments, but it's a false portrayal of who Christ actually is. May the Lord bless you.